Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to the Old Testament book of Hosea. Today we find ourselves in Hosea chapter 5. I'd like to pray uh, briefly before we begin to study this together. So if you've located that, let's, let's bow our heads and let's ask God to bless our time together. Oh, oh Lord, we do ask that in these next few moments, that God, we would not just hear from a man, but we would hear from you. Lord, we need to hear from you. Because, Father, without your word, your people perish. So, God, we pray that your word would be clear and find good soil. And that where there may be stony or rocky soil, we pray that the word would plow it up and break through. And that the Holy Spirit of God would see to it that your word accomplishes what you intend. Bless our study, we pray today. Of Hosea chapter 5, in Jesus' name we ask it, amen. <clears throat> Most of us know that Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, or at least the cheapest way to make the light bulb. You may have heard it said before that the, the story is, of course, told that the discovery came quite slow for him and his associate. And his assistant, who was working on the project, was quite discouraged at the process. And apparently one day, um, Edison's assistant kind of voiced his frustration about it, saying that he was tired of coming to work every day and there being failure after failure after failure after failure. And upon hearing this, Edison supposedly said something like, Sir, we haven't failed a thousand times. We've just discovered a thousand ways to not make a light bulb. We only have to find the one right way in the end. Well, when it comes to the issue of sin, there is only one right way to deal with it. But we human beings have invented a thousand wrong ways to deal with it. And nobody was better at inventing wrong ways to deal with their sin than the nation of Israel. And this is what we see today in the chapter before us here in Hosea chapter 5. If you've been with us, you know that for four chapters, God has made it quite clear to the nation they have sinned. He's cataloged their sins. He's named their sins. He's exposed their sins. And even though God has done all of that, because of their pride or their embarrassment or their shame or their ego or whatever it might be, they won't humble themselves to deal with their sin in the right way. And instead, they decide to invent wrong ways to deal with their sin. Instead of dealing with their sin as God said and making things better for themselves, they decide to do it their own way and they only make things worse for themselves. Many of you have seen, you, you, know, the old, you know the old TV show, The Andy Griffith Show? Most of you know, know that. There's a, you may have seen the episode when Barney falls asleep in church. Have you ever seen that one? And Andy sees it and they, they walk out after church and, and Andy looks at Barney and he says, So, Barn, what was the sermon about? And Barney looks all shocked because he realizes, and he said, oh, he said, it, it was about sin. And Andy said, well, what did the preacher say about sin? And Barney said, well, he was against it. <laughs> so in the spirit of Barney Fife, let, let, let me, let, 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 let's be clear about this, okay? The preacher this morning, your, your pastor, most certainly is, is against sin. Why? Because the Bible is against sin. Why? Because God is against sin. But none of that changes the fact that we are sinners who will sometimes sin. And so my job is not only on the one end to warn you, don't sin, but also to equip you with what to do when you have sin. 
Because left up to ourselves, many of us don't deal with it in the way that we should. Our fallen instinct is to sin on top of our sin. And that's exactly what we see Israel doing in this chapter, in Hosea chapter 5. In fact, this chapter is going to sound eerily familiar to all of us, I suspect. Notice where it starts in verse 1. It says, Hear this, O priests. Give heed, O house of Israel. Listen, O house of the king, for the judgment applies to you. So this chapter is another rebuke of the nation's leadership. Look there at verse 1. He rebukes the religious leadership. He speaks of the priests. And then he rebukes the political leadership. He speaks of the king. And here he's rebuking those that are leading the nation, both spiritual and in government. Now, to be clear, the whole nation is at fault, but Hosea is saying here at the beginning of chapter 5 that the leaders are particularly at fault. Because it's the leader's job, when there is sin, to model repentance for the people. They should be the first ones in sackcloth and ashes. But they're not doing that. They're refusing to do that. And notice the result, verse 2, the revolters have gone deep in depravity, he says. They're not just sort of walking around in sin or splashing in the puddles of evil. The, the Hebrew literally says, you're knee deep in transgression. You have waded into this thing. It's not just that there's, there's sins, such as chapter 4, verse 1, which says there was stealing and lying and adultery and paganism. That there, those specific sins, yes, were happening. The problem was that in addition to those sins, they wouldn't deal with them the right way, and they chose to deal with them in a sinful way. So there's the compounding effect of sin and more sin, one on top of the other. If you want the whole chapter in a... In a and a simple idea, I tell my boys often, I say it's simple. If you mess up, fess up. And refusing to fess up is another mess up. And you're only creating more problems for yourself. But that is the instinct we all have. That when we fess up, or excuse me, when we mess up, we want to try to handle it ourselves. And that's what Israel's going to do here. I have no doubt there is some in this room that you are knee deep in depravity. I've done this job long enough. You have been wading into your sin and swimming around in it. And you've tried to handle it on your own. And all of us, no doubt, are tempted. That's our first impulse. That's our first instinct. And so we all need to listen closely to the message of God from Hosea chapter 5. So God's going to expose several wrong ways, a, a few of the thousand, if you will, wrong ways to deal with sin and only the one right way to deal with sin. Many wrong ways, and then he'll conclude the chapter with the one right way. Notice the first wrong way to deal with sin comes in verse 3. Verse 3 says, I know Ephraim, and Israel's not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the harlot. Israel has defiled itself. The first wrong way to deal with sin that we see here is, number one, to hide it. Hide it. God uses several nicknames for the northern kingdom here. In fact, before the first service, somebody came up and said, Who's this Ephraim that I keep reading about in Hosea? I said, well, and I explained. The, the northern kingdom, remember Israel was split into two. There's the ten tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. The, the, the north is Israel, the south is Judah. This northern kingdom is who we're talking about here. That's who Hosea is preaching against. And this northern kingdom, he calls them Israel, he calls them Jacob, he calls them Samaria, which is the capital city, and his favorite nickname is Ephraim. That's the dominant tribe of the north. And he says in verse 3, I know Ephraim. Now, to be clear, he's not just saying, I know who Ephraim is. 
Better yet, God is saying here, I know who Ephraim is, and even more, I know what she has been up to. This echoes the words of Jesus in the letters to the churches of Revelation where he says, I know your deeds, I know your deeds, I know your deeds. God is fully aware of who we are and what we are doing. I know, he says, and then he says in verse 3, and Israel is not hidden from me. It appears that the people were trying to hide and think they could get away with it. But God says, no, 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 that's not the case. He is reminding his people of what we call his omniscience. My kids asked me one day, they said, what does that word mean? What do you mean that God is omniscient? It means that God knows everything about everyone, everywhere, every second of every day. And when we find ourselves knee-deep in sin, isn't that one of the first doctrines we forget? We forget it. We think we're going to be fine. God says, no, nothing's hidden from me. The psalmist was much more eloquent than me when he said, if I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I go to the depths of Sheol, you're there. It doesn't matter where I sin or where I try to hide it. The psalmist says, God is there. Heaven may be a long way from planet Earth, but God has 20-20 x-ray vision. He sees and he knows. And nothing is hidden from him. And the people thought that they could hide. In fact, God proves that he knows. Because in verse 3 he says, you have played the harlot. You have defiled yourself. God tells them exactly what they've been doing. He describes it for them. Church family, listen to me closely. There is no such thing as a secret sin as long as there is an omniscient God. He sees and he knows. Adrian Rogers once said, to err is human, to conceal it is too. That's our knee-jerk reaction, isn't it? Since the Garden of Eden, we run, we hide, we try to disguise whatever we've done like it never happened. Little kids do this instinctively. They wipe the crumbs off their mouth. They try to erase the walls and cover it up. But it's not just little kids. Big kids, we do this too. Do you remember the story of Achan? Joshua chapter 7. They went into Jericho, and God says, you go in there and you defeat them, but you don't take any of the spoils. And Achan walked in, and he saw a some, little something, something that looked good, and so he decided to sneak it out with him, despite the word of the Lord. And the next thing, they go into battle and lose, and Joshua finds out their sin in the camp, and he goes around, and he figures out who it is, and he goes to Achan and says, what have you done with the sinful treasure, with this thing that you've done? You remember what Achan said? It is, quote, concealed under the dirt inside my tent. He was trying to hide it. Nobody will know. My friend, God always knows. He sees under the dirt. He sees under the floorboards. He sees under the mattress. He sees anywhere and everywhere he needs to see. Nothing is hidden from his sight. I could tell you what Augustine said about this or Martin Luther or John Calvin, but nobody said it better than Johnny Cash. Johnny Cash said, you can throw your rock and hide your hand and work in the dark against your fellow man, but as sure as God made black and white, what's done in the dark will be brought to the light. That's it. He sees and he knows. We may not be murderers using bleach to clean a crime scene, but we all have that fallen instinct to cover our tracks. Telling a half-truth is a whole lie, and God knows the story. You can erase your browser history, but God can still see it. Your boss may not see you pilfering from the company, but God's counting every single penny. Nothing is hidden from him. Proverbs 28 says, He who conceals his transgression will not prosper. So let me ask you, are you hiding something? From your parents? From your spouse? From your boss? From your church? Because you might be hiding it from all of them, but you are not hiding it from God. He sees and he knows. That's the wrong way to deal with sin. There's a second wrong way. Not only is hiding it the wrong way, number two, a wrong way to deal with sin is to normalize it. Normalize it. Look at verse 4. Their deeds will not allow them to return to their God. 
for a spirit of harlotry is within them, and they do not know the Lord. Now, there's a lot in verse 4, but I want to focus you on that phrase. He says, a spirit of harlotry is within them. The word spirit there is a lot like today we talk about uh, you go to a football game or a basketball game, you should have team spirit, right? The idea is everybody dresses in the right clothes and they cheer together and they chant and they sing. All, all that's going on, right? That, that's the idea here is that there's this sort of collective spirit of harlotry and paganism and sin. It's the spirit of the age, if you will. And they've been swept up into it so much so that it's, it's filled them. They're, they're now just following their own hearts. They're just doing what they feel like they want to do. And this spirit is within them. Notice verse 5, Moreover, the pride of Israel testifies against him. So notice they've now gone a step further. Because now, he says, their pride proves my point, God says. Now, now at this point, they're kind of strutting around like everything's okay. Like this is no big deal what they're doing. The sin has become culturally acceptable, if you will, and it's become perfectly normal. Listen, the only thing worse than hiding your sin is when you get to the point that you stop hiding your sin. And you start flaunting your sin. And that's what they were doing. They were making blog posts and Facebook updates and having parades. And this was this is the big deal. This was totally normal. Look at verse 5 again. He says, And Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also has stumbled with them. Again, do you, do you see that? So Ephraim and Ezra, that's the northern kingdom. They stumble in their sin. But then he adds Judah. This is the south. That's not who the letter's to. That's not who the book is to. But he's including them. Why? Because the basic idea here is that they're all caught up in it. The northern kingdom is stumbling in sin. And the south sees it and says, oh, well, that looks like a good idea. Let's go join them and do that. And everybody is stumbling along in their sin, doing what they should not do. And now it's become normal. There's this national spirit of sin and pride that has set in. I, I know like some of you, I, I spent a little time this week trying to keep up with and watch the hearings on Judge Kavanaugh this week. And I found myself at several points for various reasons cringing at some of the things that I heard and, and watched. But at the same time, I think I probably cringed a whole lot more when I saw how Christians were responding to it online. Name calling and mockery and slander. That might be culturally acceptable. That is not biblically acceptable. We, we do not wage war with flesh and blood, and we don't wage war as flesh and blood either. Just because others are doing it doesn't mean that God's people should stumble along with the culture. And it's a danger when we normalize and we get accustomed to it. Many people think that leprosy is a skin-eating disorder. If you see a person with leprosy, they're often missing fingertips and knuckles and toes. But leprosy doesn't actually eat at your skin. It attacks your nervous system. We know from science the reason people lose fingertips and toes and even the ends of their nose is because they have no sense of feeling in it. And so you get your finger caught in the door, you cut it, and it gets an infection or it gets gangrene or you, you rub it raw and you never even know it because you've become totally desensitized to it. That's what was happening in the nation my friends, how much have we become desensitized by the world around us? We stumble right alongside with the world. What once shocked us as God's people, it no longer shocks us. We watch it and celebrate it and sing along and we just do as the world does. And it's normalized. Ephesians 5 says, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness but expose them. It's disgraceful to speak of the things which are done by them, Paul says. Teenagers, when you start saying stuff like, well, my friends are doing it, or begin to think, I just want to fit in, then you're on track to normalize sin. Others may be stumbling along, others may be strutting in their sin, but we must never join with them. 
It's wrong to hide it. It's wrong to normalize it. Number three, it's it's wrong to mask it. It's wrong to mask it. Look at verse six. They will go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord. Now you think, well, that sounds good, right? Now they're doing what they should. Uh, Not quite. Look at verse 6. But they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. If you read this in light of the rest of Hosea and some of his contemporaries, what you see here is that them taking their flocks up to, to sacrifice, first of all, they weren't doing it in the right place in the first place, but second of all, they were doing it just for show. It was empty religion. It was hollow ritual, mere ceremony. It was shallow penance. We've done some bad things, and so we now got to counterbalance it out, and we're just going to do some good things. We're going to offset the sinful stuff by just kind of going around and and doing some religious stuff. And they began to look at this not uh, as as some kind of trade-off, not looking this as a relationship with God, but like it's some zero-sum game. Just mask it is what they did. In fact, look to the end of verse 7. It says, now the new moon will devour them with their lambs. You say, what does the moon have to do with it? Well, the moon helped them. It served as part of their calendar, the lunar calendar. And several of Israel's key holidays, their key religious practices, they happened when the new moon came. And so literally what some of the people were doing is they'd walk around sinning for 29 days, and then the new moon came, and they said, well, let's go clean up. The new moon's here. We'll we'll go take care of it that one day, and and we'll just do everything else as we want. I'll kind of live however I want, but I'll I'll, kind of go to church occasionally, maybe especially Christmas and Easter. Those seem to be like really important holidays, and I'll do that and just kind of mask what I'm doing. I can prove that's what he's talking about because Hosea's contemporary was a guy named Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 13, Isaiah said, I, God says, I hate your new moon festivals. And he says, bring your worthless offerings no longer because they have become a burden to me, God says. Why? Because these people honor God with their lips and their lambs, but not their hearts. And they were just trying to mask it. Rather than cleaning out the mold on the walls, they decided just to paint over it with a fresh coat of religion. You probably have heard before the the Greek word hypocrite. In the ancient world, the hypocrite was actually a play actor. If you've ever seen like the logos for a drama club, it's often two masks, right? Kind of a smiling face and a frowny face. Because the hypocrite would often come out as an actor and would have two masks and they would play one role, hold it here, and they'd play another role and hold this mask. And and in all of this, they were simply pretending. It wasn't real. It wasn't true. It wasn't right. They were just pretending. That's what Israel was doing. Religion was just something to pretend and kind of make themselves feel good. They were masking it. Here's the question. And I beg of you to ask yourself this question. Do I love God or do I love having the appearance of loving God? Do I love holiness or do I love having the appearance of holiness? Because those are not the same thing. Israel wasn't the first ones to try to mask their sin and to hide their sin. Adam and Eve were the first. If you remember, as soon as they realized they had sinned, as soon as they felt guilty, as soon as they knew they were naked, they went off and created the very first false religion called fig leafism. I mean, what else is it? We're going to cover this thing up. We're going to try to take care of it ourselves. We're going to try to fix this on our own. And they were just pretending and hiding from God as if everything was okay. Psalm 51, what did David say in that great psalm of confession? For you do not delight in sacrifices, because the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. There's an old Puritan prayer from the book, The Valley of Vision, in which they pray, Save me from the false hope of the hypocrite. That's a prayer we should all pray. We all need it. Save me from the false hope of the hypocrite. It's wrong to hide it. It's wrong to normalize it. It's wrong to mask it. Number four, Hosea says it's wrong to redefine it. 
A wrong way to deal with sin is to redefine it. In verses 8 and 9, the people stop paying attention, so he yells at them. Blow the horn, a trumpet in Ramah. He basically tells them to pay attention again. But then notice what he says in verse 10. The princes of Judah have become like those who move a boundary. On them I will pour out my wrath like water. Now, pay attention to this closely, because his message is for the northern kingdom, Israel, but now he throws in a word about Judah, the southern kingdom. That, that's not who he's mainly talking to, but he says the, the leaders of Judah are following the cue of the leaders of Israel, and they have decided to, to, to do something they shouldn't do. And they have become like those who, who move a boundary. Now, I think the main point of this is that they are cursed. Deuteronomy 27 says, Cursed are those who move the boundary marker of their neighbor. So I think that's what he's talking about. But if you read Isaiah and Micah, Hosea's contemporaries, he cites what looks like some pretty specific cases of people literally doing this. It'd be like if you owned a half acre of land and you're planting your crops for, 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 for food and you look at it and say, man, I just need a few more rows of beans. I just need a little bit more for my cucumbers. And rather than honestly buying that land, you decide to dishonestly take that land. And so in the middle of the night, you go over and pick up all the rocks that mark the boundary and you move them over 10 feet. And you've created some land, some space that you're now going to claim as your own. Rather than respecting the property line, they redefine the property line. Rather than establish, excuse me, recognizing the established boundary, they just pushed the boundary out a little bit. They were redefining, in essence, what was right and wrong. And then he continues, verse 11, Ephraim is oppressed, crushed in judgment. Why? Because he was determined to follow man's command. Now, the Hebrew here is a bit ambiguous, but I, I think when he says they're following man's command, it can also be translated they're following another person's policy. Now, who is Israel supposed to get their commands from? The Lord. But he says, you guys are bound and determined to not respect the boundary markers that God has set up and you've gone outside of that, and you decided to look to the, to the words of a man, the policies of another nation. In light of verse 13, it seems that they're looking to the Assyrians for guidance. So rather than listening to the law of Moses, rather than listening to, to, to Moses' commands, they said, well, as long as the Assyrians say it's okay, then it must be okay. And they've just redefined what are the actual commands that they're to live by. And that is not the right way to deal with sin. I mean, think about it. How many of us in this room, we, we have already, in just a few short years, we've pretty much just gotten used to same-sex marriage. We don't think about it anymore. We, we don't get upset. We don't weep over this. We don't even pray for it much anymore. But I'm telling you what I've said before. Christians should not roll over on this issue. Why? Because we will gladly render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but the definition of marriage does not belong to Caesar. Redefining it doesn't make it right in the eyes of God. You can move the boundary line all you want. That doesn't change it. I quoted part of this last week, but I'll quote it again in Isaiah. He says what? Woe unto those who call evil good and good evil. But then he goes on, those who exchange light for darkness and darkness for light, for that which is bitter, for that which is sweet, and that which is sweet, for that which is bitter. Woe unto those who are wise in their own eyes, who know better than God does, who've redefined the boundary line of where sin is. We've discovered that it's easier to redefine sin than to repent of sin. It's not just big stuff. What the Bible once called greed, we now excuse as ambition. We try to deal with our sin by minimizing it or downplaying it or distancing ourselves from it. Just, just listen sometimes. I mean, seriously, listen sometimes when, when you hear these public apologies written by, you know, celebrities or politicians or, you know, people who got caught with their hand in the cookie jar 
I mean, red-handed, just as guilty as sin, listen to their apologies closely. Instead of saying things like, I was wrong, I have sinned, I did X and Y, they say stuff like, mistakes were made. That's called redefining your sin. That's called refusing to own it for yourself. And redefining it is not the way to deal with it. There's another way that's the wrong way to deal with it. By the way, I didn't tell you this sermon had six points because I knew some of you would leave before I ever started. So <laughs> we're making good time. It's, it's no worries. It's wrong to hide it. It's wrong to normalize it. It's wrong to mask it. It's wrong to redefine it. Number five, it's wrong to numb it. It's wrong to numb it. Look at verse 12. Therefore I, that's God speaking, I am like a moth to Ephraim and like rottenness to the house of Judah. The word moth there may also be translated as maggot. If you think about the picture in verse 13 where he says Israel is like a, a sick, wounded man. And, and what happens if a corpse is left sitting out and it's unattended? Maggots will soon come in. And God says, that's what I am to you. Because you've got a wound, you've got an infection, and you're not willing to deal with it. God says, I'm going to be like a maggot that's going to eat away at it. He says at the end of 12, and like rottenness to the house of Judah. It can be translated also as gangrene. What does gangrene do? It eats away at the limb. God is saying, listen, because of their sin, you have this wound and you're injured, but you should be cleaning it out. But instead of cleaning it out, instead of dealing with it, God says you've allowed more harmful bacteria, if you will, to come in. So God says, I'm going to allow this thing to get infected so that you realize how bad off you are. And look at what else they try to do. Verse 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wounds. Notice, they're not ignorant of this. They know they're doing wrong. When they saw it, what did they do? Verse 13, then Ephraim went to the Lord. No, they went to Assyria and sent to King Jerob. Now, you don't need to know who King Jerob is specifically. But the idea here is when they realized that they were spiritually and, and politically and government, when they realized that they were sick and they weren't dealing with it, they didn't turn to God. They turned to a pagan nation. They turned to an outside foreign power. They looked, listen to me, for an earthly remedy for their problem. They're trying to deal with their problems by borrowing from a foreign power and looking somewhere else. Now, nobody in this room, I, I suspect, is calling on Assyrians to help you. But we are all tempted to turn to foreign powers to help us in the midst of our sin. To look for earthly solutions, earthly remedies, ways to escape it, ways to, to delay it so we don't have to think about it. I, I learned this last week, maybe some of you know this, I learned this last week that in the state of Alabama, there are more, get this, there are more painkiller prescriptions written than there are people in Alabama. Now, I'm sure many people have a legitimate medical need. I'm not speaking of that, but I'm sure there's a whole lot of people trying to numb reality. Who are just trying to escape it. Who rather than dealing with it, are trying to just numb it. To look for some earthly foreign power to deliver them, to distract them, to numb them, just to get away from it for a little bit. We turn to all kinds of things, be it substance abuse or sex or music or sports or career or money. And we think that some of these, if I could just distract myself on the internet a bit, if I can just find myself partying one more weekend, that I'll never have to deal with it. That's the wrong way to deal with sin. Looking for an earthly foreign power to get you out of it. Because look what he says in verse 13. He, King Jerob, is unable to heal you or to cure you of your wound. There is no solution in the remedies that earth has to offer. It might distract you for another weekend. It might numb you for a few more days. It might help you escape it for just a little bit longer. But eventually, eventually, it'll run out. 
It will not heal you. And that's what you need. So how can we be healed of our sin? The good news is we can be. And that's where Hosea terminates this chapter. Because having given five wrong ways to deal with sin, he concludes and punctuates the chapter with the one and only right way to deal with it. Hosea says, finally, the right way to deal with sin is to forsake it and seek God. Forsake it and seek God. Verse 14, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear to pieces and go away. I will carry away and there will be none to deliver. If you read verse 14, even in the English, there's an emphasis here. Notice the repetition of the word I in that verse. There's a sense in which the crescendo of this chapter is that God has been saying, as a nation, you've been turning to everyone and everything else, be it the Assyrians or to King Jerob. You've tried to, to, to escape it. You've tried to do your religion. You've tried all these things. And verse 14 says, God says, what about me? What about me? What about me? That's what verse 14 says. And God says, if I have to, I will be like a lion who pounces on you with guilt. I will pursue you. I will chase after you until what? Verse 15, I will go away and return to my place. God's going to go hide in his den, if you will, until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. My friends, when you try to deal with your sin without God, God says here in verse 14 that he might make the consequences worse. He might exacerbate the situation. If you don't deal with your sin by coming to God and repenting of your sins and throwing yourself on the mercy of God, he will see to it that you have more and more sleepless nights. He will see to it that you hear more and more uncomfortable sermons like this one. He will see to it that your sins will find you out because you will reap what you have sown until you acknowledge your guilt and seek him. That's the only solution that will heal you. It's the only thing that will bring a restoration of your wounds. The people have refused to acknowledge it. They've tried everything else except God, if you will. And God says, I will wait for you to seek me and to turn to me. See, what you don't realize is that God, yes, God loves you so much that he won't leave you in your sin. He will come after you. Because he desires to pour out his grace and his forgiveness and to pour out his mercy upon you. He doesn't want to see you run. He wants to see you near him and with him and to know his presence and to know holiness and to truly delight in his presence. That's why Spurgeon said, when we deal harshly with our sin, God will deal gently with us. My friend, I beg of you. I beg of you. If there is anything that I have said today that God has used to cut you to the heart, I plead with you today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. I beg you don't do that. Repent while you still can. Because God is abundant in loving kindness. He delights to forgive you today and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So how do I do this? James says what? Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. That's a start. Confess your sins. See, I know, I, I firmly believe that God brought this passage for this Sunday for some reason. And I beg of you, do not white-knuckle the seat in front of you for one more Sunday. If God is convicting you as we sing, come pray. Come confess your sins to me or to one of the elders. Seek, you say, that's going to be embarrassing. God gives grace to the humble. That's the only people he gives it to. 
He doesn't give it to the proud. He resists them. But he gives grace to the humble. I beg of you, I plead with you by the mercy of Christ to turn to him in faith. Be delivered from the chains of sin and know the forgiveness that comes only through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for the word of Hosea 5, a word that cuts really close to the bone for all of us. And so, Lord, we, we, I, I, I ask of you, Lord, that you would use this for your glory and your honor and the lives of your people. Oh, God, we ask that you would humble our hearts before you, that we might know your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. Lord, thank you for the promise that you will cleanse us of all unrighteousness if we confess our sins. Help us, Lord, to forsake the way of the wicked and to pursue the way of the righteous. For the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.